Good day. Today is 26th December, Boxing Day in the Western calendar, celebrated as a public holiday in Britain. Um, given that I seem to have forgotten, largely I think, as a result of unwellness, illness, I've had suffered from a viral infection over the last couple of days, since I have forgotten, apparently, to wish everybody a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year, or at least Season's Greetings. May I make up for that uh, lapse by doing so now? Of course, in the Russian Orthodox world, um, the festivities, the holidays don't begin until New Year's Eve, Christmas being celebrated on the 7th of January, not on 25th December, as it is celebrated in the West. Ukraine, by the way, um, is divided on this issue. The old Orthodox Church, the one that the Ukrainian government is intent apparently on outlawing, um, it uh, follows the Russian calendar, the new churches which have been established in Ukraine to take the place of the old church, supported by the Patriarch of Constantinople, they, of course, do follow the 25th of December as the Christmas holiday. Anyway, let's put all this aside. We'll see, by the way, on the subject of Christmas, as we're talking about Christmas, I recall that last year President Putin proposed a Christmas truce, Christmas being, of course, the 7th of January, as far as the Russians are concerned. The Ukrainians rejected the idea. We'll see whether... President Putin this time uh, proposes the same thing. But anyway, one way or the other, we'll see what the Russians actually do. And in the meantime, let's get back to the general state of things in the world. And let us start where else with, but with Ukraine. And the Christmas holiday period has brought a series of very bad military blows for Ukraine, a whole succession of what seemed to me to be painful mili military disasters. The first was confirmation from the Russian Defence Ministry, from Defence Minister Shoigu no less. Um, in a meeting with President Putin, he actually reported directly to President Putin about this, confirmation from the Russian Ministry of Defence that Marinka has indeed finally and been, have been finally and fully captured by Russia. And the Kremlin has provided a readout of the discussion between Putin and Shoigu. And Shoigu, who seems to have, by the way, um, dashed immediately back to Moscow to wrap up a, 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 a lengthy meeting with the Defence Ministry Board, but who nonetheless went to St. Petersburg, where Putin at the moment is uh, located. Anyway, um, Shoigu reported in, reported in this way to Putin about what has happened. Today, as a result of active offensive operations, the assault teams of the South Group of Forces completely liberated the town of Marinka, located five kilometres southwest of Donetsk. Over the past nine years, the armed forces of Ukraine have created a strongly fortified area there, connected by underground passageways with well-fortified defences on practically every street that are well protected from air and field artillery strikes. There were permanent fire positions and a ramified system of underground routes. Owing to their decisive actions, our servicemen breached the fortified area. Considering that there are over 3,000 residential buildings in that town and each one was well or a well-fortified position, the fact that this town was liberated naturally reduces the defence capabilities of the armed forces of Ukraine and provides us with extra opportunities to further advance in this direction. Importantly, we have significantly pushed the artillery further back to the west from Donetsk. This allows us to protect Donetsk from attacks 
more effectively. And then Putin asked active actions began in June. Right, and sure you said yes, but these streets are fairly long with over 3,000 buildings. I believe um, it is appropriate to suggest awarding state decorations to those who actively participated and distinguished themselves in the liberation of Marinka. And then a lengthy discussion took place in which a particular officer was commended for his role in the fighting. He was an officer who was apparently a colonel in the Russian army some time before the fighting in Ukraine started. He was dishonorably discharged from the Russian military for some <laughs> undisclosed transgression. He then apparently volunteered to fight. As soon as the fighting began, he fought in Marinka in the most courageous way, being wounded several times. Um, he'd reached, been reappointed, given, re-given officer rank. He was given the rank of lieutenant. Um, Shoigu uh, wanted to promote him to major. Putin came back and said, well, you know, it's regulations say that he can only be appointed to captain. But since I'm the commander-in-chief and the president and I make the regulations, I'm going to change the regulations and make him major. And apparently after this meeting with Shoigu, Putin actually spoke to this man. It's the sort of thing that military leaders in war, wartime, if they're sensible and wise <laughs> and have an understanding of the importance of public relations, of course do, and Putin knows how to do exactly this sort of thing. So anyway, in summary, Marinka has indeed been captured. All of it has. And this has been um, largely true now for about two weeks. But as my colleague and friend Alex Christoforo pointed out in a program we've recently done, um, discussing the military situation in Ukraine, the Russian Ministry of Defense is extremely conservative in reporting gains, and it's taken them some days to come out, well, some weeks, in fact, to come out, and finally, to finally confirm what <clears throat> was already well known, that is that the Russians control Marinka, and they don't just control the main metropolitan area of Marinka, but all the outlying parts of it as well. So Marinka is now fully under Russian control. And as sure you correctly says, this is a town of around 9,000 people before the war, located just five kilometers from Donetsk city. It was indeed a place from which the Ukrainians launched artillery strikes on Donetsk city um, at various times over the course of the conflict since 2014. And um, it was indeed very, very heavily fortified by Ukraine. Now, what Shoigu hasn't discussed is the somewhat tangled story of the Battle of Marinka. The Russians basically began operations to clear the suburbs of Donetsk of, the Ukrainian pre of their Ukrainian presence in August of 2022. It was in August 2022 that the Russians launched an attack and captured the village of the heavily fortified village of Pesky, which was another of the major fortified areas that the Ukrainians had captured around, um, around Donetsk in the fighting in 2014. And that which they'd created into a major fortified position. And in fact, there was this belt of fortifications that the Ukrainians weaved around Donetsk in the eight years before the special military operation began. Pesky was a part. Avdevka, which is close to Pesky, was another. And Marinka was a third. And in the autumn, the Russians began an attack on Marinka as well, the autumn of 2022. 
The things for the Russians were very complicated and difficult in the autumn of 2022. They were short of men. They were found themselves on the defensive in um, uh, first in Kharkov region and then in Kherson region where the Ukrainians launched their two autumn offensives, the ones which regained significant amount of ground from the Russians. The Russians had to withdraw. The advance on Marinka in the autumn was not, not pressed home, and there were reports um, back in the autumn, as I remember, in around October of last year, that the Russians had actually captured Marinka, but those reports were untrue. The Russians had gained control of part of this small town, but the Ukrainians remained fortified, remained in their fortifications in control of, I suspect, the greater part of it. And then there was a long, quiet period as the focus shifted to Bakhmut. The Russians, or to be more precise, the Wagner organization, at the request of General Surovikin, who was at that time the overall Russian commander of forces in the, in the theatre, launched Russia's winter offensive aimed at capturing Bakhmut. And that offensive progressed until Bakhmut was eventually captured. It was a grueling and extremely difficult battle. And um, during that time, the situation in Marinka was put on hold. And then, as Putin says, around June time, even as the Ukrainians were starting to crank up to, war, to launch their offensive, their great summer offensive, the Russians began to turn their attention back to Marinka. But again, there were hurried redeployments that had to be made because part of the spearhead which was supposed to clear Marinka were the Chechen forces. I remember them being deployed to Marinka. I remember Ramzan Kadyrov saying that he'd received a personal order from Putin himself to clear Marinka. But then the Chechens had to be hurriedly redeployed to the Bakhmut area where the Ukrainians were engaging in a counterattack. And then they had to be redeployed to Rostov in, within Russia itself to um, isolate Prigozhin's forces during Prigozhin's mutiny in June. And then, of course, the summer months came and the advance on Marinka had to wait whilst the Russians defeated Ukraine's counteroffensive. And then once the counteroffensive was finally out of the way. That was when the Russians finally got round to finishing the unfinished business from last year and have now finally captured Marinka. And the news of Marinka, not just Marinka itself, the capture of Marinka itself, is important. It now means that two of the most important fortified positions close to Donetsk, created by Ukraine, um, Marinka and Pesky are both now under Russian control, but it's now increasingly clear that the entire Ukrainian position around Donetsk city is crumbling. The Russians are continuing to press home hard near Avdevka itself, and there's been more reports of tense fighting around Avdevka. The Ukrainians again have apparently attempted some kind of a counterattack in Stepovoye. Uh, that village, the latest reports say, is in the grey zone. In other words, neither side controls it. But the Russians continue to push up north along the railway towards the heights, um, towards this village of Otochernia. To capture it, apparently that will put them in a very strong position. And they're pushing very hard within Avdevka itself. And there's been a particularly tragic story coming from Avdevka. The source for it that I've read is Strana. Now, this may not be 
This has not been confirmed by the Ukrainian Defence Ministry, but Strana tends to be a pretty reliable and good journal, and they do seem to have good sources for this kind of news, and I fear that this story is true, and if it is true, it does perhaps give a sense of the catastrophic situation that the Ukrainian troops in Avdeevka are facing. But the story is that um, there was an agreement, that a decision was made that some of the Ukrainian troops in Avdeevka would be granted what was what would in effect be, I suspect, Christmas New Year leave. There was apparently a lot of dissension as to who should be granted this leave. 108 soldiers were selected. That's about a company's worth. Um, apparently some of the other soldiers who were left behind pleaded with those who were granted this leave to be able to take their place. But none of the soldiers who were granted leave agreed to this. And then they all boarded their coaches, which were going to bust them out of Avdeevka. And the coaches left Avdeevka and have been heard of. Nothing officially has been reported about them since. And apparently this happened some time ago now. And the overwhelming probability is that these co coaches were caught in the open by Russian artillery and by Russian drones, in which case the coaches will have been destroyed and presumably the men who were looking forward to getting their leave and to rejoining their families are now either wounded or dead. If this is what has happened and more likely than not it is, then this is a particularly tragic moment in this war, but it does perhaps illustrate again, more practically, how difficult the situation for Ukraine in Avdeevka is becoming. The pressure on Avdeevka grows with every passing day. Now, if Avdeevka falls soon, that will mean that the Russians will have taken three of the key fortified positions of Ukraine, close to Marinka, Pesky, Marinka, uh, close to Donetsk, Pesky, Marinka, and Avdeevka. One can start to talk about the siege, the long siege of Donetsk city, the one that the Ukrainians have been conducting since the summer of 2014 being finally lifted, um, as various Russian commentators, such as Boris Rozhin, have pointed out, the Ukrainians will still be able to make artillery strikes against Donetsk city for some time. Um, the range of their guns would still make it just about possible for them to continue to do this even if Avdeevka is captured, but it will become increasingly difficult, and on the assumption that the Russians continue to push westwards, eventually Ukrainian artillery and even um, high Mars missiles will be out of range of Donetsk city itself. The Ukrainians will be able to continue to launch cruise missile attacks on Donetsk city for some time, but would that indeed be a wise use of their limited stock of cruise missiles? Well, we'll come to all of that shortly. So, news for Ukraine from this central part of the battlefront is very bad. Uh, Marinka lost. The Russians advancing beyond Marinka. In fact, Shoigu actually referred to this. He said that we... Uh, um, and. Uh, that they're able now to um, take more offensive action in the Marinka area. There are more reports that the Russians are steadily now clearing the village of Novomikhailovka, south of Marinka, and they're also pushing apparently 
to the west and north of Marinka as well, steadily clearing Ukrainian positions. And there are Ukrainian defence lines west of Marinka, but they are not obviously at the same level of sophistication as the ones that existed in Marinka itself. And of course, if Avdevka falls, even Western commentators have conceded that the situation will become crit critical. Further north in Bakhmut, the situation for Ukraine also appears to be extremely bad. There have been reports that the Russians now control part, perhaps even as much as half, of the village of Bogdanovka, that they've captured the heights to the north of Bogdanovka, which supposedly enabled the, um, was where the main Ukrainian defences close to Bogdanovka were located, that this Ukrainian counterattack that was launched, um, which I discussed just before Christmas, that's been not only repelled, but pushed back, that the Russians are now in complete control of the entire Dacha area to the west of um, Bakhmut itself, and that they're pressing now hard on Ivanivska as well, though it seems that they haven't yet launched an actual attack on that village yet. So bad news for the Ukrainians in Bakhmut. And there's also been more reports, heavy fighting near Kupiansk, um, continued fighting over Sinkovka, this village that the Ukrainians are desperate to try to hold on to. They seem to recognize that it is the key to Kupiansk. But further south, more reports of more Russian advances in the Liman area. These advances seem to take, seem to be about one kilometer, one and a half kilometers at a time. There, we're not talking about any sort of blitzkrieg, but anyway, the Russians continue to advance steadily and effectively in the Liman area. So, an accumulation of very, very bad news, militarily speaking, for Ukraine. One gets an overall sense of the Ukrainians desperately trying to hold the line in one place after another, becoming more and more stretched, burning up through more and more reserves, lacking artillery, their men becoming increasingly exhausted as they try to do so. And Ukraine, uncertain about whether it's going to receive more weapons from the West. Little sign so far that Congress is prepared to authorize more financial aid. There was discussions in the West a few weeks ago, a few days ago, about seizing Russian assets for the moment that idea seems to have been, they seem to have cooled down. There seems to be strong opposition to this from some European countries. I suspect that Clearview, which is the financial operator, which apparently um, holds many of these Russian assets, and which is one of the key Western deposit companies um, through which, which, uh, which holds funds and through which international transactions, major international transactions are settled. I suspect Clearview is strongly opposed to the seizure of these assets. It knows that its reputation would be utterly destroyed if this happened. Perhaps the Belgian government is unhappy, therefore, and they may be pushing back with the EU. Who's to say? But anyway, this plan, for the moment, is not being followed through. Um, we'll see whether uh, that, that holds. But anyway, uncertainty about Ukraine receiving extra funding, great uncertainty about Ukraine receiving um, extra weapons, no sign of it receiving additional artillery shells in any quantity. The Ukrainians are also complaining that the guns and howitzers and self-propelled vehicles that they've been receiving from the West 
are constantly breaking down and are proving impossible to maintain and are too fragile for wartime conditions. And on the mobilization front, things for the moment in Ukraine seem to be in a kind of a logjam situation. On the one hand, there are lots of pictures of Ukrainian uh, uh, um, draft um, officers continuing to round up people in the streets and things of this kind. Um, Zelensky says that he's been asked by Zeluzhny to call up half a million men because that's what the Ukrainian military needs. Um, but Zelensky says that under no circumstances will he, Zelensky, agree to women being drafted. Presumably this was strongly opposed by many people in Ukraine. Um, now Zeluzhny has weighed in. He says he doesn't know what Zelensky is talking about. Well, he didn't quite say that, but he said it's not true that he asked for half a million men. He said he didn't actually cite any kind of number at all. So, you know, talk about half a million men. Zelensky says it's Zeluzhny's idea. Zeluzhny says it's Zelensky's idea. No, both agree that there's been no actual final decision one way or the other. Um, men, uh, uh, draft officers still trying to round up people to put them in the military, but apparently the numbers of people coming forward is tiny, and the problems of getting people to join is a mounting, and so far there's been little in the way of extra recruitment, and all kinds of ideas being floated about recruiting people uh, who have fled to Western Europe, Western European governments, very divided about what to do about this. I've discussed previously how their legal traditions and their legal values, on the one hand, or to preclude them, forcing men to go to Ukraine to fight. But of course, their investment in the war in Ukraine pulls them in a different direction, Anyway, for the moment, it all looks very chaotic and disorganised. And there, no doubt, some kind of mobilisation is underway. It looks like it's a spatchcock blundering affair. Now, given all this, given this cascade of bad news. What do you do if you are Ukraine's media managers? Well, you try to change the narrative. Now, I make no apology for talking about narratives about this war. The first thing to say is that even in the Western media, there's now growing acknowledgement that a lot of this is now about narrative. I discussed um, recently uh, an article in The Guardian talking about how um, the American government needs to change the narrative on, on Ukraine by persuading Ukraine to go on to the defence and calling that a victory of some kind. So change the narrative. Anna Tolivan and responsible statecraft saying essentially the same thing. Change the narrative. Gideon Rackman quoted a US official um, actually telling him, and this is in the Financial Times, telling him that the United States needs to flip the narrative in some way on Ukraine. So narrative construction is something that is not, you know, just an invention, a, a, a fantasy. It actually does take place. And can I say, to some extent, it always takes place during war, during wartime. And especially when the news is bad, governments that are losing or having to handle bad news are going to look around for good news to displace the bad news. And this is something that Ukraine is doing and for which, by the way, in my opinion, it should not be criticised for. Um, as I said, every government in wartime does this to some extent. 
It's just that Ukraine is very good at it. Now, let's then discuss these two big news stories that we've seen over the last couple of hours. The first is that um, a couple of days ago, I discussed how um, a, the Russian Air Force had lost a Sukhoi 34 fighter jet. And this is undisputed. There's been pictures of the... Um, uh, uh, there's apparently photographic confirmation of this. All of the Russian channels accept that this is correct. Well, directly after that, we had a string of claims coming out of Ukraine that they've actually shot down three Russian fighter jets in connection with that incident, then a further five the following day, then it was ten over the course of a week. <laughs> President Zelensky went and gave a broadcast making repeating some of these claims. This directly after he claimed, Zelensky claimed that he'd got this indestructible air defense shield from the West. Then we had a report that I saw on one of the Ukrainian telegram channels that the general staff is now uh, shuttle, shuff, shuttling Patriot missile systems around Ukraine in order to ambush um, Russian forces. That, by the way, is a logistical impossibility. Now, I have had some time, obviously, looking at the Patriot missile system. I mean, it is a huge, elaborate complex made up of many, many different parts. It can't just be moved around in the way that this report from this telegram channel implied. Some other air defense uh, assets can, NASAMs and Iris Ts and such things, but certainly not an entire Patriot missile complex. I mean, that is impossible. I mean, it's conceivable that from time to time, one Patriot missile complex might have been redeployed, redeployed but certainly they can't operate like mobile systems operating in constantly shifting positions around the battlefronts. I mean, that, as I said, is a logistic impossibility. But anyway, a report to that effect appeared. All of this intended to give credence to this story that all of these Russian aircraft have been shot down. And all of this happened alongside a whole cluster of reports about the F-16 fighters. Now, when you actually look at these reports about the F-16 fighters, they don't actually tell us anything new. There are reports about F-16 fighters being delivered to Ukraine or about to be delivered to Ukraine. Um, um, but there's also squirreled in acknowledgement that these F-16s are not yet operational. Um, that there's still lots of work to be done to repair the infrastructure in Ukraine before they can become operational. April might be the time that they are still operating. But there's one way or the other, there's been a huge amount of talk about the presence or not of the F-16s. And unsurprisingly, some people, Dima, for example, at the military summary channel, are putting together all of these Ukrainian claims about these shot down Russian fighter jets and the F-16s and are thinking that maybe the two are somehow connected and that the F-16s are already operating and it is they who are shooting down all of these fighter jets. Now, can I say straight away that I do not know exactly what is happening? I mean, I don't have access to information, the actual secret information of the Russian or Ukrainian militaries. However, Russian telegram channels, one in particular, which has been republished by Slavyangrad, who, in my experience, are very skilled at editing and distinguishing between the good channels and the bad ones, and the ones that are straightforwardly bogus channels, possibly created, for all I know, by Ukrainian intelligence. Anyway, the ones that the information 
from Russian sources, which looks to me the most reliable, essentially denies this entire story. They say, yes, one SU-34 was indeed lost, but all of the other claims of Russian, Russian fighter jets being shot down by Ukraine are untrue. No Russian aircraft or helicopters have been lost apart from that one over the last week. And on balance, I think this is probably more likely the truth than not. Now, I say that I appreciate that some people who follow this war more closely than me are giving more credence to the Ukrainian claims than I am. People like Riba, for example, and Dima at the Military Summary Channel. But it seems to me that they're mainly taking their information from what the Ukrainians are saying. And on this, <laughs> I think, briefly, that they are wrong. I think if there were more Ukrainian Russian planes being shot down, we would have seen more evidence of this, more actual concrete evidence of this by now. And I would have thought that it would be difficult for the Russians to conceal losses of aircraft on anything like this kind of scale. So I think that this story is again being, is a bit of spin by Ukraine, again, to distract from its difficult battlefield losses. Obviously, if more information comes to light, which contradicts this view, then I will comment on it. But this is my view at the moment. And we've seen another big attempt today, or rather I should say last night, also to distract attention away from the bad military situation on the battlefronts, which is that Ukraine launched a major attack with apparently scalp, these are the French equivalent of the Storm Shadow missiles. They've launched another big missile strike at Sevastopol. And there's been reports that at least one missile got through, as happens. And the Russians, the Russian Defense Ministry, has provided a summary of the information about what happened. And I'm going to quote briefly from TASS, because I think this is the most, probably still the most reliable source of information about what happened over the course of this attack. Anyway, um, the attack apparently began at 4.16 a.m. Um, um, the, 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 we're then told it's two Rus Ukrainian Sukhoi 24 aircraft fired missiles at Feodosia, but were in turn destroyed by Russian air defenses near the village of Zhovtun, 125 kilometers northeast of Nikolaev, which is an interesting fact. It, it shows that the Russians were able to track these aircraft from a very, very long range and were um, able to shoot them down at quite significant range. The task then goes on to say one person was killed and two people sustained wounds. The Novocherkask, a large amphibious assault landed ship, suffered damage and windows were shattered in six buildings and damage to a train station building was reported. And so one person killed, two people wounded, damage to an amphibious landing ship and um, some damage to some buildings. Now, the amphibious landing ship in question, the Novocherkask, I seem to remember, was the same landing ship that the Ukrainians uh, managed to sink um, quite early in the war. The Russians raised it and brought it to Feodosia for repair. And <laughs> I suspect that it's been hit again by the Ukrainians in this attack. It looks like it's un an unlucky ship. For all I know, it's been sunk again. We'll see whether or not the Russians this time sink its 
worthwhile raising the ship and repairing it. There are lots of reports in the West about how this is a warship. Grand Shapps, the British Defence Secretary, says that the Russians have lost 20% of their surface fleet in the Black Sea, which is... I, I don't know how he comes up with this figure, by the way. Certainly none of Russia's major um, uh, missile assets in the Black Sea have been affected at all. But anyway, that's what he says. <laughs> and uh, um, um, this amphibious ship, as I said, it's been, it was apparently uh, being repaired, so it doesn't make any great difference in terms of the actual progress of the war. But it does give, especially the British media and um, Ukraine, something to talk about, to crow about um, over the course of what is turning out to be, in every other respect, a very dark Christmas period. The British media, which has been talking euphorically about the uh, sinking of the Feodosia, uh, of the Novocherkask, if it has indeed been sung, um, for example, as far as I can see, um, are either not mentioning the fall of Marinka or are only slightly alluding to it. So, you know, it, it works and it is a entirely standard thing for governments in war to do. One should not criticise the Ukrainians too much for doing it, except that in this case, it might have been a rather expensive operation. Now, I say this because if it is correct that the Russians shot down two Suhoi 20, the two Suhoi 24s that launched this attack, then these are very valuable aircraft of which Ukraine has only a very limited number. And they are, of course, the major aircraft used to launch uh, Scalp and Storm Shadow missiles. I think that the total number was around six. And if two have been lost, then that number is down to four. Now, if that is correct, then damaging a ship which was under repair and losing two of your most valuable aircraft would, it seems to me, be an extremely expensive price to pay in return for what is ultimately nothing more than a media victory. And this isn't the first time, by the way, that Ukraine has done this. Um, expended valuable equipment to achieve a PR victory, which um, ultimately changes nothing. The attack, this missile strike on the empty building of the Russian Navy um, in Sevastopol a few months ago being another case in point. Bear in mind also that presumably several scout missiles will have been used in this operation. Um, the Russian chief of general staff, Gerasimov, said that Ukraine was supplied with around 200 of these missiles. It's already lost around 100 of these. So the number of these missiles is now shrinking. It's probably impossible for Britain and France to replace them. And valuable missiles, again, are being used primarily to score PR wins. In terms of military calculus, perhaps not such a good idea. Anyway, this is what I think about all of these reports over the next few days. About the attack on Feodosia, I think we have a fair outline of the facts. Maybe we don't yet know the full extent of the damage to Novo to the Novocherkask, but let's assume that it has been sunk, it still is consistent, the whole 
view would be consistent with what I say. If we're talking about the shooting down of the Russian fighter jets, well, for the moment, we don't have any more news than what I've said. The lack of that news has led me to the conclusion that I have done, which is, as I said, that this is a largely imaginary win. But, of course, if news, if information comes forward which provides some corroboration for the Ukrainian story, then I will cover it. But for the moment, this is the best conclusion that I can draw. So, overall, very difficult military situation for Ukraine this winter. They're losing ground. They're losing ground in important places. Um, their position in Donbass is crumbling. And to make things even worse for them, as I said, there's reports of these major Russian reinforcements moving towards Zaporozhye region, perhaps preparing to launch another offensive there. And the Ukrainians themselves, increasingly at odds with each other, Zeluzhny, Zelensky, quarrelling about mobilisation, and the men on the battlefronts exhausted and increasingly disaffected and out of ammunition. And into this darkening picture, because that is what it is, we have a very extraordinary, extraordinary article appearing in the New York Times. And it is one of the most interesting articles, actually, that has appeared up to now in this war. Now, can I just say, I say it is an interesting article. It is an interesting article more for its title than for its substance. The title tells us that there is some kind of negotiation or attempted negotiation between the Americans and the Russians underway. We're told that, and this is again to the title itself, that uh, Putin quietly signals he is open to a ceasefire in Ukraine. And then you actually go to the article itself. I'm not going to read it, by the way. Um, and what you discover, it's one of those strange... Um, experiences that you get with French pointillist art, that from a distance you see a sort of picture, but when you come up and look at the details, the picture seems to scatter, <laughs> and you can't really find very much to hold on to. And this is exactly what this article says, because on the one hand, it says that there's not actually any negotiations of any kind going on. Putin himself seems brimming with confidence because his army has repelled this offensive. But, you know, he's got an election to win in March, and so he'd like to wrap up this war now. And for that reason, he's sending all kinds of signals that he'd be interested in a ceasefire, which basically freezes the conflict along the current front lines. And any statements or comments by the Russians themselves to the contrary, well, you know, this is inconsistent with what Putin is signalling in private. And then you look for corroboration for this. What is the evidence for this story? And, well, we're told that it was partly confirmed by two ex-Russian officials who still have links to the Kremlin. What does that even mean? Who are these people? In other words, they are not Russian officials. We also see that the New York Times did try to get confirmation of this story from an actual Russian official, specifically Putin's spokesman, Dmitry Peskov, who denied it, said it isn't true. He said it's conceptually all wrong. He ref referenced... Putin's words about the fact that um, the Russians are going to continue until all the objectives of their special military operation are achieved. I've discussed all this in many programs recently. And then, of course, we have the usual people who 
are providing with us with this information, which is American officials and international, uh, uh, third, inter, uh, international officials as well, whose identity, of course, is not disclosed. And that, to my mind, gives it away. It is clearly a, so a story s sourced, planted even, by officials of the US government. And a lot of people have been connecting this story to the fact that a Russian Illusion 96 aircraft, which apparently belongs to the Russian government, has flown from Moscow and landed in Washington DC airport and um, stayed on the ground for some 54 hours. And it has been assumed that a big Russian delegation was in this aircraft and that they were engaged in some detailed, long-term, deep negotiations with the United States over that period. And that this um, story in the New York Times is in some way connected to the presence of that aircraft. Well, can I just say straight away that on that point, I think that is correct, but I think that the connection is different from what many people um, suppose. Now, let me say, let me first of all start with information provided to the Duran itself, but also separately published by two gentlemen who have been extremely privileged to host on the Duran, Larry Johnson and Alistair Crook. Now, both of these two gentlemen were recently in Moscow. Both of these two gentlemen attended a conference there. Over the course of that conference, they had meetings with various Russian officials, including one particular official. I know the identity of this official, but since neither Alistair Crook nor Larry Johnson are disclosing this person's identity, I don't think it's proper for me to do so either. But I know who it was. Anyway, they had meetings with these Russian officials, and with this Russian official in particular, and this Russian official whom they spoke with told them, and these other Russian officials told them, that there are no contacts of any substantive nature going on between the United States and Russia, that the Russians, in fact, are dismayed by the inability of the Americans to speak to them in any intelligible way. And that, in light of this, it makes... Well, in light of this, it seems to me that this whole story about signals being sent to by Putin through various back channels about his willingness to open ceasefire talks, as both Larry Johnson and Alistair Crook, Larry Johnson in particular, a recent piece on Sona 21, has pointed out. If, if it really was the case that Putin was doing this sort of thing, it is inconceivable that these Russian officials, and that one Russian official that... Larry Johnson and Alistair Crook spoke with, would not know about it and would have provided that information, <laughs> would, would, have, would have provided them with the information that there are no contacts or negotiations or discussions of any type, which he did. So already we can see that this story must be wrong. And that then leads us to the question of what the purpose of this story is. Now, as it happens, just a few days ago, on the 18th of December, Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov gave a very, very long interview on television, Russian television, where he was questioned by Dmitry Symes, one of the most intelligent people um, covering Russian affairs, 
He was a person who left the Soviet Union, worked for a long time in the United States, became an advisor to Donald Trump, found that that made his position in the United States all but persona non grata, and he has now returned to Russia, and he is, hosts, I believe, a television program there, and he remains one of the most intelligent and insightful um, commentators on Russian affairs, and he gave this fascinating interview a couple of days ago with Sergei Lavrov. And this conversation between Lavrov and Symes, this interview, um, has this very interesting section. And now I am quoting Lavrov's words. Regarding the shift in sentiment in favour of holding talks, I travelled to New York in the spring to attend a meeting of the UN Security Council, which Russia presided. I met with a group of political scientists, including Richard Haas and Charles Kupchin. Afterwards, everyone assumed for some reason that it was a secret meeting and that this contact was used as a channel of some kind. Nothing of the sort. I regularly meet with political scientists when I travel to New York. This time, too, a meeting was held at my request. They agreed to meet, but asked me not to make public comments on it, which I agreed to. The information leaked several months later from the American side. I don't know what caused it. Suspicions arose that this meeting was set up at the behest of the Biden administration. Supposedly, serious matters were discussed. Providing our comment on this leak, leak we assumed that they wanted to tweak public opinion and the situation around Ukraine. Most importantly, change the aggressive mood of the Ukrainian leadership, which turned down our every proposal. No talks until Crimea is taken back. They claimed that Zelensky's formula was the only viable basis for talks, our defeat on the battlefield, and much more. Since this has become public knowledge, Richard Haas, Charles Kutchin, and their colleagues, about six people, said that since no country can win, the countries needed to settle down for some time, leave things as they are, and then resume the hostilities. But they did not hesitate to say that Ukraine needs time to replenish its reserves, materials, missiles, and other warfare attributes. But this was in April 2023. So what is Lavrov telling us? He tells us that he went to New York in April to attend the United Nations. That is public knowledge. He issued an invitation to six um, political analysts, uh, political scientists, as he calls them, of whom Richard Haas and Charles Kupchin were one, were two, and he had a meeting with them, which is something that he routinely does when he visits the United States, that he, to his and to the Russians' collective astonishment thereafter, they learned that this meeting was supposed to have created a back channel between the United States and Russia, that nothing of the sort was the case, that there was never any kind of serious back channel talk between the Russians and Richard Haas and Charles Kupchin. But Richard Haas and Charles Kupchin, but Richard Haas especially, have been going around since saying that what Ukraine needs, what the United States needs, is to freeze the conflict, except that Ukraine can't recover all of its lost territories in this war that a freeze of the conflict will allow Ukraine time to recover and rebuild, 
and that is what its priority should be at the moment. And the Russians see this, see all of these maneuvers as a device by the United States to get the Ukrainians to start talks with Moscow. Um, most importantly, change the aggressive mood of the Ukrainian leadership, which turned down our every proposal. In other words, what the Americans are trying to do is to nudge the Ukrainians towards negotiations. The United States does not want to negotiate directly with Russia itself. It is trapped in the formula <laughs> that um, it has been enunciated by President Biden that Ukraine and Ukraine alone must lead negotiations. And so they want to nudge the Ukrainians towards negotiations. They want to tell the Ukraine, they're signaling to the Ukrainians that the Russians are up to, are willing to consider a conflict freeze, even though, as Lavrov says, the truth is the opposite. The Russians are never going to sit back and agree, agree to a conflict free, freeze so that the West can simply rearm Ukraine. Um, but that's the message that the Americans want to convey to the Ukrainians. And, of course, behind that, there is the further hint that if the Ukrainians don't negotiate, well, the point will eventually come when the United States will do so over their heads, will start negotiating directly with the Russians about Ukraine. And that will hopefully panic the Ukrainians into preempting such an American move by starting negotiations themselves. And the Ukrainians have sensed this because they're complaining angrily now about this New York Times article, and they're saying that the New York Times has been deceived by Russian propagandists. And I think that is exactly what this is all about. I think this is exactly what this latest New York Times article is trying to do. It is again telling the Ukrainians start negotiations. The Russians are prepared to, to, to consider a conflict freeze. <laughs> Their public statements may be denying this, but in reality, once you start talking to them, they will agree, we promise you, they will agree. That is what they're hinting in all these, through all these back channels. And of course, if you don't start negotiations, for a conflict freeze, then of course, eventually, we might have no option but to start negotiations with the Ukrainians ourselves. In other words, this article is intended to put pressure on the Ukrainians to begin some kind of negotiating process. And coming back to that airplane, I don't know why it is in Washington, D.C. As I said, I think it is inconceivable that a high-level delegation by the Russians would be sent to Washington, D.C. in this kind of way. If a high-level delegation were indeed being sent to, to Washington, I think the Russians would insist that it be made public. If there's going to be private or secret talks, well, the way to do that is in some third country away from anybody's attention, not in this public manner. And by the way, the New York Times article says that Putin was circulating ideas about a ceasefire in September last year after the Ukrainian offensives in Kharkiv and Kherson region. And Ukraine didn't follow up with these proposals then. The implication is perhaps it should do so now. Um, of course, it doesn't mention, or rather it doesn't discuss, the fact that there was a follow-up. There was. There was actually a, a, a negotiation conducted, this time between the United States and Russia last autumn, and that was between Burns, the CIA director, and Nereshkin, the SVR 
Russia's intelli intelligence chief, the head of the SVR. And that negotiation went absolutely nowhere at all. The Americans found the Russians immovable, contrary to all this talk about in this article that the Russians were looking for a ceasefire last year. It seems that there was no interest in one from the Russians last year, and we shouldn't assume that there is any interest this year either. But anyway, this article, in my opinion, which has not been given a huge amount of um, prominence by the New York Times, is clearly another device, another attempt to get the Ukrainians to agree to negotiations, and it was planted in the New York Times a long at roughly the same time when the Americans knew that this aircraft from <laughs> Moscow was arriving so that the article and the pictures could be juxtaposed together and create the impression that more was going on than actually is. If you read the article carefully, it's absolutely clear, at least to me, that nothing is actually going on at all. It's all hints and speculations and rumours, but there is no actual concrete fact, and, in fact, everything is contradicted by everything that the Russians themselves are saying. And Lavrov himself, as we've seen, has provided the explanation. This is all about getting Ukraine to soften its position. Because the United States can see that the writing is on the wall, that they're not able to get the money out of Congress, that the stocks of weapons are all but exhausted. They want to try to find some mechanism to end the war without unacceptable loss of face. And they're trying to find some means to push the Ukrainians towards negotiations. And of course, for the moment, that's not where the Ukrainians want to go. If we ever get into a situation where there are real negotiations between the Russians and the Americans, we will know about that. We will know about them. It will not be a case of airplanes turning up in DC where they can be filmed <laughs> and things of this kind and articles appearing in the New York Times. There will be straightforward announcements um, by the State Department and the Foreign Ministry in Moscow. And we've seen nothing like that. And on the contrary, actual Russian officials, Lavrov, whom I've just quoted from, the officials that Alistair Crook and Larry Johnson met, they're all telling us a completely different story. So there we are. Um, a war going badly for Ukraine. Ukraine desperately trying to spin the news to shape the narrative back in its favour, succeeding to some extent, at least in the West, and even amongst some, I've noticed, as I said, Russian or pro-Russian commentators as well, who are always willing to believe the worst about what is happening on the Russian side. And more attempts by the United States to try to get some kind of a negotiating process underway between Ukraine and Russia, but one which does not threaten political damage to the Biden administration, one which gets them off the hook. The Russians, showing no sign of being interested in any of that or of being deterred in any way from the course that they're following over the course of the war. Now, um, I should say that um, Shoigu, as I said, he dashed back to uh, Moscow <laughs> to wrap up this meeting of the um, Russian Defense Ministry Board. In fact, the Russian Defense Ministry has provided um, 
a um, um, a um, photographic study of all of the participants, and um, I noticed that amongst the su summary, find summing up words that Shoigu gave, he said. Um, um, I would like to emphasize that it was the combined efforts at the front and the rear that have enabled our troops to seize the initiative on the line of contact today. Russian troops are steadily gaining more and more advantageous positions and are expanding their areas of control in all directions. We are making consistent progress towards the achievement of the stated objectives of the special military operation. Now, that does not sound to me like the kind of comment that the defence minister would be making on the eve of a ceasefire. <laughs> um, we are making consistent progress towards the achievement of the stated objectives of the special military operation. Anyway, that's my summary of the information from Ukraine. There's been lots of things going on elsewhere in the world. Firstly, and just briefly, the French have now pulled out of Niger. Alex Christopher and I have done a dedicated program about this. This is not by it, this is an important event. It is, in my opinion, a victory for Africa in the sense that the French after the coup that took place in Niger back in the spring, um, moved heaven and earth to try to change the situation in Niger, to bring back to pa into power the, the, over, the previous overthrown uh, pro-French president. They threatened military intervention, and that didn't work. The Victoria Newland came to Niger and tried to cajole the Niger generals into splitting from the uh, military leaders who had launched the coup, and that didn't work either. Um, they tried to get the ECOWAS states to intervene militarily in Niger, and for a time it looked as if this is about to happen. We covered it extensively on the Duran and on this channel, and that didn't happen either. Africa collectively combined to oppose a intervention of that nature in Niger and to, in other words, support Niger's sovereignty and it worked and France has had to withdraw and for the first time since the 1890s there is no French presence in Niger and Niger, well, it's not entirely free to shape its future destiny, no nation in the world ever is but at least it's more free of French supervision than it has ever been for more than a hundred years now. So, an important event in Niger and one with big implications for Africa. And we've also had an election in Serbia, an election which entirely predictably res resulted in a clear-cut win for President Vucic's party. And it's clear that together with uh, its coalition partners, the Serbian Socialist Party, Vucic's party will command a strong majority in the Serb parliament. But this, of course, was unsatisfactory to some people. The strangely named Serbs Against Violence umbrella group, which brought together all the various pro-Western, pro-EU parties in Serbia, which also contested the election, and which managed around 17%, again, about 17% of the vote across the whole of Serbia, and less than half the vote in Belgrade, where they expected to win. Anyway, predictably, as is always the case with these colour revolution attempts, which this is, uh, went out and protested in the streets. They said that the election was uh, faked. Um, EU officials, or West German, pol uh, German politicians, tweeted their support for them. 
I have to say straight away that given the real political mood in Serbia, about which we on the Duran are well informed, uh, given President Vucic's exceptional political skills, given the overall solidity of the Serbian political system and government, and given the fact that these people, as I said, only managed to win around 17% of the vote in the election, there is no realistic prospect of this colour revolution succeeding. And it seems that most of the protests, so far at least, have been dispersed, though it is not impossible that more attempts of that nature will be made. And lastly, there's been a big meeting of the Eurasian Economic Union in St. Petersburg. Putin presided. Prime Minister Pashinyan of Armenia turned up and fully participated. After all, as he must know, membership of the Eurasian Economic Union, the Russian-led economic organization that is bringing together more and more of the former countries of the Soviet Union, um, has, anyway, it has been highly beneficial to Armenia. Armenia this year, apparently, is managing 9% GDP growth, which is largely, I suspect, accounted for by its membership of this union. And Prime Minister Pashinyan seems to understand that, and apparently he's going to have bilateral meetings with Prime Minister President Putin, as well as attend this meeting. But the key event of this meeting was that the Eurasian Economic Union has now, as well as charting a strategy for itself, has now agreed a free trade agreement with Iran and is in the process of agreeing free trade agreements with the UAE and Egypt. Now note that Egypt, the UAE and Iran are all about to join the BRICS. They've just agreed a free trade agreement with Russia, which is, of course, a part of the Euro Eurasian Economic Union. And Russia is the key player within the BRICS alongside China, which is one of the other big key players, along with India and Brazil. So you can see how all of the various pieces are knitting together. The Eurasian Economic Union is more tightly integrating, but always within the overall framework of the BRICS. Other countries join the BRICS. They agree free trade agreements with the Eurasian Economic Union, and that opens up their trade for China as well. The various linkages and structures that are sewing together all of these various countries and are work, building, working towards that point where we will eventually um, get the whole system of trade and new currency movements operating. Well, we've just taken another big step forward towards that. And of course, Putin has also been busy discussing the Gaza situation. He's had a long conversation with President Mahmoud Abbas of the Palestine Authority. This directly after that, those extraordinary events in the Security Council that I just dis discussed just before um, Christmas. So lots going on, but Ukraine remains <laughs> centre stage in terms of its geopolitical significance. And here the trends are clear, and they will continue to become clearer and stronger still as we move into 2024. Well, that's me for today. More from me soon. Have a very happy Boxing Day, wherever you are. And let me remind you again, you can find all our programmes on our various platforms, Locals, Rumble and X. You can also support our work via Patreon and Subscribestar. Um, you can check out 
our shop um, where we're providing selling all sorts of amazing things at a, with a Christmas discount I believe that the discount code for those who don't know is Christmas 2020 but anyway you tap this out but I'm sure you can find it there and please also remember if you've liked this video to tick the like button and to check your subscription to this channel so greetings to you blessings to you during this Christmas period have a very good day and I will be back tomorrow.